ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه او بريز دو تو الله وي بريز هيم وي سيك هيز فورجيفنس اند وي اسك هيز اسيستنس ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا and we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our souls and the consequences of our bad deeds man yahdihi Allah fala mudilla la wa man yudlil fala hadiya la whosoever Allah guides no one can lead astray and whosoever Allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance that no one can guide wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh and I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah alone with no partners and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger may Allah exalt his mention and grant him peace أما بعد فأن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار As to what follows, verily the most truthful speech is the book of Allah, the Quran, and the best way of life and guidance is that of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the worst of affairs are the ones that we introduce into this deen of ours, because every newly introduced matter is an innovation, and every innovation will lead astray, and whatever is astray will be going to the hellfire. In the last lecture, the uh, whole of a lizard or the whole of a lizard uh, we had mentioned that the Muslims wind up imitating the disbelievers in four broad dimensions creed we gave some examples of that worship we gave some examples of that behavior we gave some examples of that and celebration and we didn't elaborate much because the matter of celebrations is a broad topic of its own so I saw fit, I saw it fit to dedicate a special lecture dealing with celebrations uh, that are, you know, whether cre created by the Muslims or adopted by the Muslims from the non-Muslims. And um, basically, the saddest thing about this conflict, as we speak, is that many Muslims have fallen victims to this concept of involving themselves or engaging in celebrating some sort of Eid some sort of Eid we don't know how it came about we may know I will mention some but somehow it is something that is very common so much so that if you a person who adheres to the Quran and the Sunnah you, you stick to that during the times of celebrations you become considered among the people to be an extremist a fundamentalist and a terrorist right they must add the terrorist and everything there's a terrorist now somewhere along the lines when speaking about the Muslims right uh, and so why why is that and how come this happened you know what the truth of the matter is the main reason the main reason why so many Muslims have fallen victims to this to these celebrations is because of the misunderstanding of a very fundamental concept of Islam you know what it is? who would like to guess? what is that fundamental concept? I spoke about it you know tremendously in the last lecture actually the last lecture was really based on that conception Okay, if you're too tired, I'll guess on your behalf. Well, I don't have to guess, I know the answer. We are leaders, not followers. We are leaders, we are not followers, not, as in negating. Not only that, it's even more than that. We are not only leaders who don't allow our followers or the people in Islam to follow others we don't even allow others to imitate us that was back then at the time of the Sahaba at the time of the Khilaf of Umar radiallahu anhu and afterwards when Muslims were ruling the countries you must believe this you must believe this read the history non-Muslims were not allowed to imitate Muslims because they used to they tried to put on a turban imama they told them chop it in half no imama for you 
Women try to dress like Muslim women, regular women try to dress like Muslim women, they said, you better change your dress code. This is not for you. Anything that they did which was particular to the Muslims, the non-Muslims were prohibited who were living under the Islamic rulership from imitating the Muslims, let alone doing it the other way around. Not only we are leaders who don't follow anyone, we don't even allow others to imitate us. Because Allah had given us a distinct uh, religion uh, in terms of the law. Of course, the aqidah of Tawheed is, is, is uh, among all prophets and messengers, is consistent. However, things pertaining to appearance, dress code, way of life, what you find in Islam, you find it in opposition to what you find in previous scriptures and previous laws. Why? Because of this fundamental principle. And this is what I want every youth and those who are older, don't worry, you're included, to understand, not only from this lecture, to understand as a general principle, we are leaders, not followers. We don't follow anyone. And when do you celebrate someone else's celebration or festival? When you're following them. Otherwise, you wouldn't. You will be sufficed with what you have. And the narrations will further explain that. طيب. Now, I wonder, Wallahi, I wonder whether we read the Qur'an. And if we do read the Qur'an, I wonder whether we understand the Qur'an. And if we do understand the Qur'an, I wonder whether we believe what Allah says in the Qur'an. Do we really believe? Or do we think something else? Well, maybe Allah means this, maybe He doesn't. You know that, that conception, that concept constitutes kufr, disbelief. It will take you way out of Islam, like a rocket. See you later. Mafi Islam for you. No Islam for you. If you think Allah did not mean something in the Quran, even a letter, even a letter, even an alif lam mean, we don't doubt. Do we believe? What Allah said in the Quran. And if we believe, do we act? Do we implement? These are a series of questions that we need to really uh, think about. I mean, all of us have been reading the Quran, Allah knows for how many years. And many of us can see in ourselves uh, lack of change. It's like nothing happens, right? Yeah, I read and I know. Yes, I've heard. But, and, brother, you know, where are we going? Well, you know, I don't know. Ramadan, after Ramadan, and a month after a month, we read the Qur'an, we hear the Sunnah, but some just simply don't move forward. They don't move forward. It could be because we really don't believe, but I doubt that. We must believe in the Qur'an. We are missing the application. Just like the Sahaba. The Sahaba. Radiallahu anhum wa ardahum ajma'in. Unbelievable, unbelievable group of people. This is why they were the Sahaba. But you know what? Allah had allowed us and given us means to follow their ways. When we speak of them and we praise them, we don't mean that they are something that we don't strive to be. It doesn't mean like, okay, you know, you're never going to be like the Sahaba, so you're okay the way you are. No, 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 no. When we speak of them, that means we strive to be like them. Now can you imagine how they would react when an ayah like this was recited upon them? اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم ولا تتبعوا من دونه أولياء قليلا ما تذكرون Follow that which has been sent down to you from your Lord. From your Rabb, your master, the one who knows what's good for you. And do not follow allies beside him. Little do you remember. Unbelievable. Allah speaking to us. You know the followers of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Follow what has been sent down to you from your Lord. And do not follow other allies. Don't follow other people, other religions, other leaders, other tawagheet other objects of worship little do you remember because we don't you will find 
many of the Muslims, unfortunate, unfortunately, we ask Allah to, to bring us all back to the path of guidance. We wish goodness for everyone. But many are imitating the disbelievers in every aspect of life. And it, it, it's no longer confined to, to the worldly material you know, matters. It became involved in the very essence of our religion. So much so that Tawheed is foreign among some Muslims. If we can still give them ti- the title of Muslims. Tawheed is foreign. Shirk is, is integrated with every act of worship. Sacrifice, dua, salah, even tawaf. They became for others than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because when we hear this ayah, it's like we don't really understand. Anyways, here's another ayah for you, and you can imagine how the Sahaba reacted. وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلْ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ and you know the hadith of Abu Mas'ud radiallahu anhu which explains this hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he, he drew a line with a stick on the ground for the Sahaba and he said this is the path of Allah then he drew lines on the right and on the left different paths on the right and the left of this line he said these, these are other paths on the top or on the head of each one is the shaitan calling you to him then he recited this ayah and that Allah said and this is my straight path so follow it and do not follow other paths otherwise it will separate you from the path of Allah Azza wa that he has admonished you with perhaps you will become among people who have taqwa people who will protect themselves from being misguided from the day of judgment from Allah's anger and from entering Jahannam taqwa accommodates all of these meanings because it's protection and we need protection from Allah's anger from Allah's hellfire and from Allah's wrath and anything which will separate us or will veil us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here's another one for you Allah then spoke to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاكَ عَلَى شَرِيعَةٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعْهَا وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ then we have put you on a plain way on a clear path of our commandment then follow it Allah speaking to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu then follow it and do not follow the desires, the whims, the inclinations of those who don't know meaning Allah called them ignorant those juhal those ignorant among the creation don't follow their ways Allah has given you a particular command a particular sharia, a law follow that and don't follow the ways of others then it goes on to the extent that Allah warns the Prophet sallallahu the affair is so serious that Allah Azza wa Jal warns the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the one who is most keen on keeping straight on the path and never going astray still Allah told him وَلَئِنِ اتَّبَعْتَ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ بَعْدَ الَّذِي بَعْدَ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ مَا لَكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَكَ مِنْ مَا لَكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيٍّ وَلَا وَاقْ and if you follow their desires, their inclinations, after the knowledge has come to you then really you shall have against Allah no ally or protector this is to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah is telling him if you, if you leave alone the knowledge which you have and we are included in this by the way when Allah addresses the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this is from the fundamentals of the deen we are automatically included unless there is an indication that this is specific to him when Allah addresses him particularly concerning a matter and the context will clarify and so will the tafsir of the ulama but if there isn't such an indication we are included we are being warned don't leave alone the knowledge and follow the ways and the desires of people who don't know if you do so no one will be able to protect you from Allah you say brother but everyone in the world is doing it Everyone does it, ya akhi. It's only you. You and a bunch of other Wahhabis making life difficult for us. We were having a good time until we started coming to these lectures. I was listening to music, watching television, celebrating birthdays, everything was good. I started attending these lectures, my life now is all, you know, constricted. Subhanallah. 
If you feel this way, I apologize. But this is a bad indication. Because Allah said in the Quran, فَمَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَهْدِيَهُ يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ If Allah wants to guide you, He will open your chest for Islam. Meaning you will submit to Allah. Anything that comes from Allah, from Allah you love it. You love it. Not only that you, you're doing it because you're forced to, you love it. Yes, there's this element of struggle. This is a natural thing. But in the depth of your heart, because it is from Allah, you can't help but love it. So you'll be happy that you're being further, you know, guided concerning the matters of the deen as opposed to feeling otherwise. And I hope that I was just assuming that no one feels this way. So then what do we say about someone who says, but everyone else in the world does it? We say everything you have, every complaint you have has been addressed by Allah Azza wa Jal Himself in the Quran. وَأَن تُطِعْ أَكْتَرَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يُضِلُّكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Unbelievable ayah. Unbelievable ayah. If you follow most of the people upon earth, they will mislead you from the path of Allah. Allah is already telling us. Numbers don't make a difference. In business world, they say quantity and quality. You could have a hundred bad chairs and as soon as the people come, they break. Or you have one chair that can fit all of you on top of each other. Which one is better? A single chair. Even if your brothers are on top of each other. Although this is hypothetically speaking, alhamdulillah, everyone has a nice comfortable chair. But one chair that is fixed and firm is superior to a hundred chairs that will not last five minutes. So you say many people do it. Say many people are going to Jahannam. That's what Allah, that's what we know in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, hadith, sahih, that from every 1,999 will go to Jahannam, one will go to Jannah. This is in the beginning of the matter. Of course, eventually, all Muslims will go to Jannah. But initially, from every 1,999. So what do you think you and I have to do to be that one person? A lot, right? We have to exert some extra effort. So we would be that one person out of a thousand. If you're going to say, well, well, brother, everybody else is doing it, say everybody else is in 999, and they may go to Jahannam. You want to go? So it's a very basic understanding, if we have the right intellect. Tayyip. Now, you see, I, I had an, a, a debate with myself for the longest time. Do I address each holiday on its own, and give you the history of it, you know, where it came from and how and why. And even though that was entertained for some time, I realized that A, it's a waste of time. B, I don't want to memorize all this stuff, nor do I want to read it from a paper. You know, how this, how this festival came into place. And also the, the historians differ about the origin of most of them. I mean, if you go back to Valentine's, you'll find, you know, uh, uh, maybe 50 different interpretations of how Valentine's came into existence. So, I'm, I will not be giving you anything solid. So, I, I decided not to do so. Malish, if that, if that child can just chill out for a second. I decided to give you a fundamental, foundational grounds on which you can deal with all of the holidays. And the benefit of that is, if you're a true Muslim that really loves the deen of Islam, this will be sufficient for you. I don't have to prove to you where the Valentine's or Christmas came from for you to abandon it. Because we will establish that we have two holidays, period. And we don't care the other ones where they came from, how they came, what their condition is, we don't care. And we don't want it. Secondly, just in case they innovate and they continue to innovate new religions, no one will come and say, well brother, you never spoke about Monkey's Day. Because now we have Monkey's Day, and you know, Darwin felt that we were very much like monkeys, and so decided to have a Monkey's Day. You spoke about Christmas, Valentine, you never spoke about Monkey's Day. Come on brothers, let's go celebrate Monkey's Day. Why? Well, no one said it's haram. So I was you know, worried that they will come up with different holidays in the future and you, you, you'll be shocked. Imagine if after some hundred years they come up with monkey's days and they go back to this text and they say, wow, this guy knew the future. I say, I don't know the future, man. Only Allah knows the future. I'm just guessing. But human beings do funky stuff. And one of them is maybe a monkey's day or some other animal. I don't know. Point being, 
I want to give us all some, something which will not make us refer to the background of that festival. Once it's un-Islamic, khali wali brother. We don't need it in our lives. How is that? I think that's better. And that way I will not keep you till midnight. Because if you read some of these, you know, histories of these, uh, these festivals, it's something ridiculous. Ridiculous. And it's a waste of time. Tab Jamil. But uh, let's enter into this uh, foundational principle through an ayah in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal in the uh, Surah Al-Furqan. One of the most beautiful chapters in the book. Or let me go back. It's not a chapter. One of the most beautiful surahs in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now I have a reservation about using the term chapter. That's a whole other discussion. Uh, where Allah Azza wa Jal at the end of the surah describes, who knows, who does he describe at the end of Surah Al-Furqan? Ibadur Rahman. Come on, brothers. Aywa. Allah describes the qualities of Ibad. Wa Ibadur Rahman al-Ladina yamshuna ala al-Ardi hawna wa ida khatabahum al-Jahilun qalu salama. Until the end of the surah is the qualities of Ibadur Rahman. Now, one of the fundamental qualities of Ibadur Rahman, which I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to make me and you among them, is. وَلَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّور They do not witness falsehood. This ayah, if you want to discuss it in detail, maybe books can be written. Just that, what, these few words. وَلَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّور And they do not witness falsehood. That includes thousands of things. If there's music, they can't stick around, they have to leave. If there's backbiting, they can't stick around, they have to leave. If people are mocking the deen of Allah, they can't stick around, they have to leave. And the list goes on. But one of the implications of this ayah, per the tafsir of Mujahid and among other among the Mufassirin from the Tabi'een, is Zur are the festivals of the Kuffar. And those Muslims, they don't witness these festivals of the Kuffar. They got nothing to do with them. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said, The festivals of the Mushrikeen combine confusion, physical desires and falsehood. There is nothing in them of any religious benefit. Uh, witnessing here, yashhadun means attending. They don't attend them in any way, shape or form. So Allah Azza wa praised them. Praise the believers who don't witness any falsehood. Included in the list, the celebrations and the festivals of the non-Muslims. Regardless of what kind of non-Muslim it is. Now this particular ayah is reinforced by the actions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the hadith of Anas radiallahu anhu wa arda, he said, قدم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم المدينة ولها يومان يلعبون فيهما فقال ما هذان اليومان قالوا كنا نلعب فيهما في الجاهلية فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله قد أبدلكم بهما خيرا منهما يوم الأضحى ويوم الفطر The messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم went to Medina when he came to Medina he found that the people were celebrating two particular days. There were two days that they were celebrating. He said to them, what are these two days? They said, these are two days which we used to celebrate, entertain ourselves in during the days of jahiliyyah, ignorance. Thereupon the Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, Allah has replaced you. Uh, please make that child, uh, if he's still making noise, if he can just go outside for a few seconds, because I'm losing my uh, chain of uh, thoughts. Barakallah feekum. Verily, Allah has replaced you. Now pay attention to the word, Abdalakum has replaced you with two days better than these days that you were celebrating. The day of Abha, which is the Eid of uh, Eid al, at the end of Hajj. وَيَوْمُ الْفِطْرِ The day of Fitr which is the day of breaking the fast. يعني عيد الأضحى وعيد الفطر. Now, listen to what the ulama have deduced from this particular statement of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. First and foremost, he did not approve. And we know that an aspect of the sunnah is a sunnah taqririya. 
a proved sunnah where the Prophet ﷺ will see something happening in his presence and he does not say anything about it. He doesn't stop it. That means it's a sunnah because he approved it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we have hundreds of examples here he asked about the origin the origin of this particular celebration when it was said to him it was from jahiliyyah a he did not acknowledge it he wanted them to stop it by telling them allah has replaced you now let's speak in common terms the term replacement what does it entail it entails leaving the former and accepting the latter. When you replace a teacher with another, meaning the other one has gone and another one has taken its place. Now, so there's no simultaneous, uh, you know, uh, things going on here. One is replacing the other. Allah has replaced you with two days better than these innovated days from Jahiliyyah and he only sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted two Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha furthermore if you remember the lecture about music when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu entered and they were the, the two girls were beaten in the deaf and you know whatever what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say inna li kulli qawmin eidan wa hadha eiduna verily for every people there's an exclusive holiday uh, festival celebration and this is ours now look at the beauty here of course this is from the from the statements of the ulama not my own uh, deduction lamb the lamb here likulli indicates exclusivity meaning this is only for them it is not for us let's let's get some examples from the quran for each religion there's a place where they will face in their in their prayer the each one are now do the muslims the jews and the christians do they all face the kaaba no the same way each one has a way has a way a direction which they face in the salah then we have a eid that is different than theirs allah says again لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجًا again لِكُلِّنْ for each of these religions we made a law and a way and a special way for them the way of islam is unlike the way of the previous religions so the lamb then indicates exclusivity this is for you this is for us قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا عَبُدُ until the end لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَ دِينَ we are on two separate ends we are on this side of the coin on top and you are at the bottom and you will stay at the bottom squashed and smashed and if we become silly and want to go down with them and be smashed alongside with them this is amazing amazingly wrong we should feel honored by Allah Azza wa Jal that we have been placed on top so then we have our holidays and they have their holidays this means any festival of any kind related to the non-muslims is haram in Islam and we want to focus on the term Eid does anyone know what Eid means in Arabic? Now of course it's translated into celebration. But the root Ya'ud. Ya'ud. Aad rajul min as safar. Auda even here. Khuruj. Wa'uda. Right or wrong? Nobody goes on vacation anymore? MashaAllah. If you have an iqama, I'm assuming you do. If you don't have an iqama, malish, no one will report you. But anyways, you have khuruj, auda. Auda is what? has to do with coming back and Eid is called Eid because it comes back every year it's something that is done yearly or annually so this is where the concept came from we don't have Eid anything that happens on annually is non-islamic un-islamic whether it is uh, anniversaries you know somebody wants to be romantic with his wife so they try you know the, the day which they got married once you're doing a Eid, because every year it comes around, it becomes a no-no. And the wife, quite frankly, deserves a treatment befitting Islamically, not only on one day of the year. Every day of the year. The same with the mother and the father and the list goes on. And I will elaborate somewhat on these. But I wanted you to understand this concept properly. 
So there will be no doubt Now we don't care what kind of religion What kind of celebration, festival They will come up, come up with In the future The Prophet wasallam established that you have a way And we have a way You want more? I will give you more Listen to this hadith which you probably never heard in your life Probably But most of this lecture is based on the book of Shaykh Al-Sahib Ibn Taymi Rahimahullah Iqtida' Sirat Al-Mustaqim Fi Mukhalafat Ashab Al-Jaheem You know, uh, taken or, or, or traveling upon a straight path In order to be in opposition with the people of the Hellfire And the, he, the whole book deals with how the Muslims should not imitate the Kuffar in the various aspects of life Now listen to this hadith, amazing hadith The hadith of Thabit Ibn Al-Dahak He said A man vowed Nether to sacrifice some camels in a place called Al Bawana. Al Bawana. So he went to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he told them, I have vowed to sacrifice some camels in Al Bawana. Now, what is the usual Islamic principle? Is that when you have a nether, you fulfill it. Right? If you vow, you keep your vow. Unless there's something wrong. Which prevents you from fulfilling the vow, such as a prohibited vow. Like if you swear that you will not, you know, uh, if you tell someone, tells his wife, that you are to me like my mother, for example. This is haram. This is haram. Uh, that kind of thing, you have to, you know, you have to break that nether and do the kafara, and that's another discussion. But if there's no such thing, you must fulfill the vow if it is halal. Now, the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell him, Tfaddal, go ahead. He asked him two questions. He said to him, were there any idols that used to be worshipped in that place at the time of Jahiliyyah? Did they used to worship any idols? So you tried to sacrifice the animal there. Was that place virtuous in the sight of the kuffar before? If so, then no. The man told him no. Then he asked him a second question. Did they hold any of their festivals over there? He told him no. He said, then fulfill your vow. So the Prophet ﷺ paid attention to the origin. If this particular location was associated with the kuffar worshipping idols or with the kuffar celebrating some festivals and you want to sacrifice the animals there with this place being held in honor by them, then no. But since this is not the case, go ahead. This is a, a, a firm foundation that should terminate any possible potential doubts that the shaitan will whisper because in our fitrah we shouldn't have any doubts but the shaitan may whisper to someone that maybe there's an exception there is no exception so let us break it down man Valentine's Day and what do you know about Valentine's Day? the most favorite day for any flower shop and in, believe me in foreign countries if there was no Valentine's, there would be no flower shops. The only ones that would remain in business are the ones that are installed in hospitals, right? Because people will continue to give flowers to the people who are sick. But if they were out on the street, there would be no flower shop a long time ago. How often do people buy flowers? Come on now. You find it on the ground, you pick it up, it's free. <coughs> I mean if it's in your area, you can't get it from the neighbor. That's haram. But the point being, Believe it or not, go to the business world and see how flower shop make businesses. They wait the whole year for Valentine's. Of course Christmas and other things as well. But mainly Valentine's because this is where all of their money comes in. And what is Valentine's? I mean, the, the origin, again, the issue of origin is, is sophisticated. But let us least to say, it is Roman adopted by the Christians. And either way, it is haram. And where does it come from? What is it really? Believe it or not, nowadays, you know, some couples, married couples, you know, they try to be, you know, funny, and they, they, they celebrate Valentine's. But who is it mainly for? Boyfriend? Girlfriend? That's what it's for. Men and women, actually some of these wild teenagers, if it's, you know, what is it, February the 14th? If it's February the 13th and they don't have someone, they just hook up with anyone. So the next day they will have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's like, I don't like him, but you know, maybe somebody will give me some flowers. So it's, what is this? Nonsense, you know? But this is the reality. This holiday is among the most wicked of all. A'udhu Billah. All you see is images of 
uh, you know, uh, you know, hearts, you know, love, and you know, the cupid and whatever, the arrow going from one side and going out from the other side, and all oh, this nonsense, man. And what it is, people trying to be loved. That's it's it's a, it's an inferiority complex. It is like a, a mental disease. People love attention and love, so they just want to get some love and attention on any particular day. But a Muslim doesn't need that. What kind of love are you looking for? The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah loves you, who cares about everybody else? That's what we should really aim for. Now if the people love us because Allah loves us, Alhamdulillah. But we try to have people love us even though Allah doesn't love us, this is no good love. So I'm not going to give you the, the history of Valentine's. Let's just say it sucks. And from now on, woe to you from writing a card or receiving a card or even putting a silly picture on Facebook supporting or, or, or acknowledging this holiday in any way shape or form it's a holiday where people commit zina where people wind up disobeying Allah where, where people who are not married engage in things that only married people engage in all these are unacceptable Islamic abhorrent sins abhorrent sins zina is so so uh, grave in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. I was just reading a fatwa today. It's an amazing fatwa. I never knew this before. This fatwa says that you know if somebody put a gun to you and said say kufur, are you allowed to say kufur? You're allowed. You're allowed to do to say a statement of kufur to protect your soul. But the ulama say the majority of the ulama say if someone put a gun to your head and force you to commit zina, it is not allowed. You're supposed to get killed. This is how grave it is. And the fatwa came that some Muslims, may Allah, may Allah uh, relieve uh, and, and elevate their suffering, some Muslims by the kuffar, to gunpoint they tell the person to go with his you know, relative, mother, sister. And he said, what are, we to, what are we to do in this case? He said, you get killed. If it was a strange woman, you're not even allowed to approach, let alone your own mother or sister. But if it was a statement of kufr, say the statement of kufr. And you don't get yourself killed. But if it's zina, no. Because it deals with, with harming the other individual and they have a, a fitter position. Amazing! That's how grave sin is. And to people on Valentine's, this is like drinking, you know, some milkshake. No problem. It's actually expected. So how can we get involved in something that is so hideous, so abhorrent in the sight of Allah? Where so many people around the world disobey Allah in this fashion. A'udhu Billah. If you love Allah and Islam, you will never be able to. And when you see people getting involved in it, you will become sick in your stomach. And you will say something about it. Next. Mother's Day. We know Mother's Day. And you know, we've, we've mentioned many times that you know, that if you really want to go to Jannah, you better be good with your mother. If anyone here thinks he can speak to his mother in a manner that is un-Islamic, by screaming at her, or, or, or you know, uh, blowing in her, you know, and, and, and you know, blowing some, some things or expressions that are unacceptable, or I don't know, anything, anything that will hurt her feelings, let him guarantee himself a ticket in Jahannam unless Allah wills otherwise. But Allah, the greatest sin after shirk is uquq al-walidayn, being undutiful and disobedient to one's parents. Be very careful. And the father is included. But the mother has a special place. So a Muslim does not, does not abandon his mom all year and he remembers her on Mother's Day. And the, or, the origin of Mother's Day is a god, goddess, I'm sorry, named Iris. Egyptian goddess named, oh not Iris, Isis. This is where it came from. And then of course it was adopted by the Romans. And the list goes on until the Christians picked it up. And then it became a popular holiday, Mother's Day. And I've pre previously told you the reality of Mother's Day. A person will disobey, will disrespect and ignore his mother all year round. Then as they say in street language, he will shut her up with a present on Mother's Day. That's what it is. Get off me. But take these flowers and I love you. Quote unquote. See you later mom. And all year round they may not even speak to their mothers. Can a Muslim do this? No, 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 no. You don't wait for Mother's Day. And if you wait for Mother's Day, 
then you are doing something that the Prophet ﷺ didn't do, nor did his companions, nor anyone who we knew to be righteous. They never waited for something called Mother's Day to love their mothers. They love their mothers all year round. And Father's Day is something similar. No need to elaborate. Christmas, <coughs> New Year, strictly Christian. And Christmas has a long history as well. Let's begin by saying Jesus, the son of Mary, may Allah exalt his mention, was not born on the 25th of December because we cannot prove it. Not Islamically, not Biblically, not historically. There's absolutely no authentic reference to that. Rather, if you want to go historically, you will find that this is some, you know, Constantine and Julius Caesar and some god, sun god that they used to worship uh, during the pagan times, eventually adopted by the Catholic Church in order to bring the pagans into Christianity. And it's a long history that I will not waste your time with. The bottom line is, Christmas is a wicked day where shaitan is being worshipped and loved in the name of the so-called Son of God which they have made equal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I will deal with the issue of, of greetings and how do we deal with that Christmas and New, Year, New Year's are Christian festivals and my brothers and sisters in Islam we have nothing to do with them even if someone said Merry Christmas to you you don't say Merry Christmas back to them and I will give you the adequate explanation as we move on in the lecture. But until then, keep it in your mind. That you will never ever get involved in Christmas or New Year's. And New Year's, be careful because some people consider it to be something ordinary. This is the Gregorian calendar, not the Islamic calendar, not the Hijri calendar. This is their, their New Year, not ours. And we don't even have a New Year's really. We just have life goes on until you meet Allah. Yes, they had to establish a time, which is time of and this, the, the Sahaba, you know, they, they differed on when to begin the Hijrah, the, the, the lunar calendar, and they wind up choosing the time of Hijrah of the Prophet It wasn't something that, you know, was from the time of the Prophet for us to have a New Year's also in Islam. And this is where many Muslims have fallen, fallen into error, where they try to do what the Christians do on their New Year's, on our New Year's. So people start, you know, uh, giving greetings to one another. This should be avoided as well. Birthdays. Huh? When was the last time you blew some candles on your birthday cake? And you know what they believe if you don't blow all the candles? Oh, no, no, it's no good. It, for, I remember from my days of Jahiliyyah.